Hello and welcome to the KPMG ET Now budget poll. I'm Ashwin Mohan and for the next half an hour, we will dissect the findings of an exhaustive survey that captures the mood of India Inc. and MNCs when it comes to big ticket tax reforms that are the need of the hour. Call it a legacy issue, but the Modi regime's cleanup act is pending and with restlessness gradually creeping in, hopes are indeed sky high from Finance Minister Arun Jaitley who will present his first full year budget on February 28th. Joining me on the show today are three top experts from the world of tax. Girish Vanwari, Head of Tax at KPMG, Subhankar Sinha, Head of Tax South Asia at Siemens and Rohan Shah, Managing Partner, Economic Laws Practice. Girish, let me kickstart the show by asking you about GAR because that indeed is a topic uh, that has kept the market participants rather busy. Applicability of GAR. If you look at the survey, 34% of the respondents among CEOs as well as CFOs have said that GAR should be deferred by 34% and 44% feel that it should be applicable in a phased manner. As of now, the overall verdict seems to me that the tax department is not really geared up for GAR and there is a fear in the markets that perhaps GAR could be used for revenue maximization rather than being used as a deterrent measure. Your preliminary thoughts, Girish? I completely agree. This does not surprise me at all. This actually tells you that 80% people want GAR to be deferred or you know, put in a phased manner. Everybody is, at this point of time, fearing how it will get executed. So till checks and balances are not put in place, just executing guard will actually be quite detrimental to the whole environment as a whole. So this is one ask which I'm absolutely not surprised with as I read this. Subhangar, how do you read into the data? Well, from a corporate perspective also, I would tend to agree because uh, the country is not yet ready for guard and till such time we have the you know, recommendations of the tax administration reforms are at least taken up. Uh, we should not even attempt to implement card. Uh, that, that would be my view. Do you think the tax regime, Subankar, is uh, well equipped as of now? Absolutely not. Because we had a very bad experience, if you recollect, when the decision of McDowell came in in the early 1980s. And we don't want the same thing to be repeated you know, with a potent weapon like GAR. So. All right, look, before you leave, that's what Subankar yeah. saying. Rohan, uh, if you look at some other jurisdictions, say perhaps UK, there is a comprehensive list of illustrations. This is where guard triggers and this is where guard does not trigger. Clearly, there is an absence of that in the current Indian tax regime. In the current circumstances, what kind of a deferral in terms of a timeline uh, would be comfortable for India Inc. and perhaps the tax uh, administration also to digest this new animal called guard? Uh, I think it goes back to what both the other speakers said, which is ultimately there seems to be a gap which is on the credibility of the tax administration system. Now, we really have to take a call on when we think that will no longer be a problem, whether that's a year away, whether that's three years away, where people feel that placing GAR in the hand of a tax administrator is no longer a weapon, but is something that will be used in an equitable manner, in a judicious manner. Everything that we can do to really close down the scope for interpretation is welcome. But when you do that, you are again reinforcing the issue that there is very little belief that tax administration will be fair. And I think the timing of GAR in that environment and given that credibility gap is always going to be a question mark. So is it a year? Is it three years? I think we just have to ourselves be clever enough to take the pulse and say, well, maybe next year, maybe three years hence. But addressing this credibility gap is clearly the number one issue. All right, point taken. Garish, let me also dig out one other interesting stat on GAR. Deferred for an indefinite period. 16% feel that could be a possibility. But let's look at the current scenario. There needs to be a clarity as far as the timeline is concerned. Because Absolutely. if it's put in abeyance, then that would again create uh, a lot of fear in the market. Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you look at what corporate or any investor wants is certainty. So something like indefinite or again one year, then again start debating next year that should it be deferred for one more year, doesn't solve any purpose. I think what we should have something which is reasonable. But if you look at the whole world, the way it's you know, converging, hmm. if you look at the whole world, look at all the disputes which are happening, whether it's a Google dispute, Amazon dispute across the world, everybody is moving to fair share of taxes. So everybody is indirectly moving to GAR. Everybody is indirectly moving to BEPS compliances and BEPS is also on the card. So one cannot expect this to be indefinitely 
you know, default. Absolutely. Mm. But I would just hope there is a clear picture that is going to come in two years, three years. These are checks and balances. This is the way it's going to come. So that everybody is not speculating again next year. All right. So I would want all three of you now to stick your neck out. In terms of a timeline in the budget, Girish, what kind of a timeline are you looking at? One year, two, two years. years? Two years because that will converge with BEPS recommendation. By next year end, BEPS should be more or less clear the way it's headed. And then we'll be ready to implement this after two years. Subankar? I would look at two to three years, but I would add one thing that in the meanwhile, the government can certainly look at using the limitation on benefits clause in some of the treaties All to right. at least some of the concerns that it has in the interim period. All right. Uh, Rohan? I'd, I'd also go with two to three years. Two to three years. So clearly yeah. two to three years seems to be a substantial time uh, for the entire uh, India Inc. as well as the tax department to acclimatize themselves to GAR. Now let's shift focus from GAR uh, to the retrospective tax laws. If you look at... Uh, the next question on the survey, which is clarity on taxation of cross-border deals where indirect transfer of Indian assets takes place. Will the controversial retro-tax retro tax laws be made prospective? 47.5% say yes, 14.4% say no, and 37% 37 are undecided. How important is it, Girish, in this budget uh, for the finance minister to bury the retro-tax nightmare once and for all? Actually, uh the retro tax is not only retro tax, there are two aspects to it. One is the retro tax itself, whether the indirect transfers rule should be retrospective. And second are the series of issues surrounding the execution of it. What is substantial? Should it be listed company, unlisted company? What is the quantum of stake which leads to a trigger of tax? Because today as we talk, mm. many shares are getting transferred overseas which lead to indirect transfer of Indian shares. So how will this whole thing be executed? Now should retrospect retrospective taxes be buried, it's a very, very sentimental ask. If we go back to the world to say, now we're going to have a fair regime and we're not going to be unfair and really we're going to put all the issues to rest, it's a very, very positive message which we send to the communities at large, that India is a stable jurisdiction. We need the money to do the various things which we want to do, be it infrastructure, be it the various projects like Digital India, Swachh Bharat, Make in India, so on and so forth. So it's a very, very positive message which you give to the community at large. So that's, that's the impact of it. But at least the clarifications have to come through because it's otherwise chaos and confusion. People don't know how to interpret it. Chaos and confusion indeed. So, Bhankar, there's another data point which says 14.4% are not hopeful that the retro tax laws will be made prospective. And perhaps these 14.4% respondents are reading into the FM's recent commentary where you said we would rather wait for the judiciary to take a call, because there are several cases wherein the controversial retro tax laws, mm -hmm. constitutional validity has been challenged. They're all pending in various high courts. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's why they're not hopeful. Your mm -hmm. thoughts? I think he can certainly look at it from a prospective basis. I don't see any judicial problem on, on that aspect. And especially if he clarifies on two aspects, as Kadish mentioned, one on the you know, definition of substantial, what is substantial uh, restructuring? And secondly, how do you tax it. I mean, is it the entire quantum of the gain or the proportionate gain? I think these two aspects, if it clarifies, that certainly helps MNCs like us, you know, especially when they do the corporate restructurings. So I think I, I would expect clarification on those two aspects, at least on a prospective basis. Rohan, lack of clarity on this aspect, has it uh, dented m &A activity in India? And if I had to point to the single largest miss in the last budget, to my mind, it was that we did not address this issue. Mm. And I think uh, it really has the attention of the world. It is one of the major talking points. Mm. You cannot be in a major business discussion or an international seminar mm. without this coming up. So I think it's high time we recognize the white elephant in the room and address it. How do we address it is obviously in the domain of the minister. But if you say that I will leave it to the courts, mm. the one question you have is, the moment it comes up in court, you have to instruct the law officers, who are the law officers of this government, as to how should they plead. And if they plead to say that any governmental action of recovery is correct, then the message is that this government stands behind that. And the other and interesting aspect, Rohan, is that as far as these laws are concerned, the government really hasn't raked in any moolah from these laws. Yeah. So the, the significant issue is, by saying let it be courts, first of all, you ask people to go through a very laborious system. Uh, secondly, you as a government have to make up your mind. And that is manifested in how your law officers will argue. And if you tell them they defend this demand, then what goes around the whole world is this government is no different from what the earlier one was on this issue. So to my mind, how he addresses it is up to him. But he has to take some definitive action. 
either in terms of you know substantial or what is discussed but to my mind the additional issue is he must protect treaty and treaty investment if he throws the treaties to the dogs mm. then that is really the more damaging message all over so in addition to you know whatever is discussed i think he must have something there for treaties to say that treaties and an investment through a treaty is effectively protected maybe it leaves vodafone out because mm. they chose to come through a non treaty jurisdiction but there must be something definitive and that definitive is not to say i leave it to the courts girish what do you think the government should be bold enough and strike this law in this upcoming budget or perhaps play it safe as the fm has been hinting no i think this is long overdue and i agree with rohan when he says that the treaty protection internal reorganization mr sunna just spoke about corporate restructuring i mean internal reorganizations where there is no change in over ownership whatsoever today is also getting caught it's high time we just clarify at least all these aspects of it all right uh, mr sinha do you think the markets might perhaps uh, react negatively if the fm misses this chance once again of uh, not overturning the retrospective tax laws because this is one aspect as both the other panelists have been pointing out is uh, is the single most biggest priority but well, i think the market will be disappointed if at least it is not addressed on a prospective basis for the past i think possibly it has been discounted but for the future we definitely need a clarification and if that doesn't happen the market might be disappointed all right so the key takeaway clearly from our panelists is that uh, this is a million dollar opportunity uh, for the finance minister to once and uh, to once and finally perhaps yeah. address this issue and uh, put it in the backyard you know, uh, rohan my, wanted to make a point worry is we tend to find very immediate reflections of success or failure on what the market does or does not do i think this is a far more substantial opportunity it is going to impact investment for times to come you know post the pm going we were in japan talking to clients post this davos delusion you know where everybody comes back saying oh we will get hundreds of billions of dollars of investment you talk to people and you know they tell you look this is a issue which really worries us because it goes to the root of whether we can trust the system so if he doesn't do something it's not about the next 3 days on the stock exchange it's about the next 3 years of sentiment qua should i or should i not invest the long term in sentiment is more important yeah. so clearly that's a worrying aspect yeah. let's move focus now to another worrying aspect and that's the imposition of minimum alternate tax or mat on foreign investors a thumping 51.94% of the respondents of the KPMG survey expect clarity girish actually the law is clear but people expect that this issue is not going to be raked or people are not going to be harassed uh, or put to test on this the law is very clear it's not applicable but any clarification on this will help because otherwise that's again a big big damp now if things are not clarified on this front forget the treaty being available or not available mat also becomes a big issue which is very clear so i don't know why this issue should come up subankar how important is it to address this issue in the budget well it's an important issue and again the controversy has been created because of you know few doings uh, going against the basic concept so i would think that the government should follow the steps which it, which it has done in the case of vodafone and uh, proactively issue a circular clarifying the issue so that we avoid litigation of this topic rohan it clearly is a very simple technical issue because here the entire issue is you have a foreign company which does not have presence in india and therefore there is no need to maintain books of accounts in india and hence you are not liable to mat it's as simple as that so uh, is is there sort of a no brainer in the budget no, i i believe it's a no brainer as a concept you cannot usurp a jurisdiction you never had mm. so you know from that perspective it it really bodes very ill that this is the sort of interpretations we have and again i think it's something that you must set right because what you are really telling the international community and your own taxpayers is that i will not respect some basic tenets of the law and then you know you look at an scz uh, z type situation then this is even more remarkable that you can have this sort of interpretation because you started by telling people invest because there will be no tax and then you say hey incidentally but i you know at least 18.5% <laughs> all right so clearly lots of hopes as far as the international tax community is concerned on that note let's slip into a short break on the other side we look at some of the other important aspects on direct taxes and indirect taxes keep it with et now Welcome back to the ET Now KPMG budget poll where we are analyzing 
some of the big ticket items on Finance Minister Arun Jaitley's budget agenda. Girish, let's now shift focus to SEZs. That's definitely a focus as far as uh, the Make in India campaign is concerned. A lot of industry is expecting tax ops on that front. Let's look at some of the findings as far as MAT and DTT are concerned. A reduction in the MAT tax rate, 51%. Reduction in the DTT tax rate, 42%. Girish, what do you make of these findings? That the ask is very clear. There is no point in giving tax holidays and taking 20% back in the form of MAT. And if you got to make job creation a reality, if you got to make you know, growth happen, it's very important to give concessions for manufacturing, for various ki kind of service creations. This is a very, very popular ask, that please abolish MAT. That's the extreme which they talk about, All right. or at least reduce it. And it's not only on SEZ, it's actually on infrastructure. It's actually on R&D benefit. I mean, I mean, take a case like you're giving R&D concessions, come and you know, do R&D in India. You give a 200% concession and then take it back in the form of MAT. What's the point? So whatever concessions are given to further a particular cause, clearly that should not be trapped under MAT. So it's really a popular ask with most of our clients. All right. So, Bankar, would you agree that perhaps SEZs have lost their charm because there were certain benefits that were, in mm -hmm. fact, intended originally, mm -hmm. but uh, as time passed, those benefits are slowly and gradually being taken away, and therefore, uh, how important is the need for uh, tax swaps on SEZs? Well, I think it's very important because uh, given the theme of Make in India, we, we certainly have to you know, look at the lost opportunity of reviving the SEZs. And therefore, in that context, I don't expect a complete removal of DDT or a MAT, but a reduction, at, least, perhaps? at least a reduction is, is definitely on the cards. All right. What kind of a reduction would you perhaps expect in the current uh, scenario? I would expect a reduction to the extent of at least 50% of the current rates. All right. Yeah. As, as much as that. Rohan, yeah. your thoughts on uh, DDT and uh, MAT on SEZs? No, my sense, again, is if you want to drive this whole agenda of make in India, make from India, and it seems somewhere the invisible target is 10,000 jobs a day, <laughs> then a lot needs to be done to really foster that culture. And certainly we're not going to foster that culture with the uncertainty to say, here is a benefit, but I take back through the mat. So from my perspective, maybe it's a very big jump to do away with it entirely, but I think it's the year to make the big jump. It is the year indeed to make the big jump. And another ambitious tax reform that uh, people responded to in the KPMG survey was introduction of the GST roadmap. Perhaps the biggest yes, 76% people expect a clear-cut roadmap as far as GST rollout is concerned. Uh, Subhankar, let's start off with you. How important is uh, clarity on GST? Well, it's definitely important. And for a company like ours, you know, it's, it would take a lot of time to make things ready or to make the company ready at the back end. You know? So I think we need a clear roadmap so that we can start the preparation. Because as of now, we don't have the draft law or the draft regulations. So we haven't really done anything substantial at, at our end. So once the law comes in, then you know, we can start that process. So it's very, very important that we get a clear roadmap uh, in this particular budget. Rohan, what are some of the specific aspects of GST which you hope uh, would uh, merit mention uh, in the finance minister's speech? You know, I think there's only so much that he can do in the speech. Mm -hmm. But quite clearly, he needs to reaffirm the go live date as 1st April. Uh, I know there is a lot of circumspection as to whether people will be ready by 1st April. But it's important to focus both government and industry on that date. So I think that reiteration would be important. Secondly, you know, there are some key factors like the place of supply rules. Absolutely. The recommended central legislation, which must come uh, very, very soon after the budget and continue to reaffirm the position every 10 or 15 days that we are moving towards this yes, GST. Yes, it's not easy. A nation which is much smaller like Malaysia took seven attempts before they could bring a GST. But having said which, uh, from here till the 31st of December, you will really need to see a progressive move to GST reaffirmed every 10-15 days. And then maybe you're going to leave a three-month period to industry mm, to sort to of almost. just make the pure transition of whatever they need to do, IT systems, you know, the, the procurement structures, the, the placement of go-downs, etc. But very, very important that here he reaffirms, says a little more, maybe comes through with something in terms of a draft legislation. But after that, 
this can't be a budget to budget exercise absolutely there is a lot that you need to need do, to do to and there is a lot you know undoubtedly there are many diverse industries and see, we have to understand that as a nation we have rarely taken any international concept and administered it as such we always have a modification absolutely on that note in fact you know, let me also get in girish girish the industry demand as far as gst rollout uh, is concerned has uh, also been tinkering of the inverted duty structure perhaps that is an aspect that could be looked at uh, to smoothen out the implementation of gst your thoughts i completely agree with you i think what the industry wants is a credible road map for execution of both these things if you look at the single biggest tax policy to make make in india happen make in india is not a budget event it's actually more to do with the policy changes at the state level local level mm. to make it really a reality the single biggest thing which the budget can do to make make in india happen is introduction of gst this country has come to a point where it needs the integrated markets it needs free flow of goods i mean you're talking about gdp increases how will gdp become 10% this is one reform which can change the way the whole country looks at business and can actually make that big event happen so i i actually feel i hope we have a very credible road map as rohan put it very very credible road map to execute this big reform all right point taken let's shift focus now to the auto sector one of the other interesting questions that popped up in the survey was the need for an excise duty cut in the auto sector 54% said yes uh can't say was 15.45% Rohan, your thoughts on this bit? No, I, I think auto is acknowledgedly an important player. Provides both revenues and provides both employment. So very important. I think an excise duty cut there, very important. But at the same time, there is a set of customs duty issues on what tax should be borne by CKD, what is meant by a pre-assembled engine, what happens if your engine and transmission are mated, hmm. what happens if they are mounted. I think those need to be clarified because you know engines while we would love for them to be made in our country it's just economical worldwide to buy them from the best manufacturers at the lowest rates so yes excise duty cuts hmm. but not the only thing we have to understand that there is some import dependence and you have to clear that as you also offer excise duty cuts all right girish your quick thoughts on uh, the need for an excise duty cut in the auto sector i actually I think it's a combination. We have to see how the interest rates pan out. I'm a big believer that for the demand to come back, real estate, infrastructure, and auto have to be supported because these three have a tremendous trickle down effect on the whole economy. From a tax policy standpoint, I mean the budget cannot go out and cut the interest rates because that's more an RBI mm. monetary policy issue. But clearly, something on the excise front which helps the demand to trigger off in these three sectors will really help the GDP to go to where they want it to go to. All right, we are running out of time, so let's quickly uh, dive in straight uh, to the last aspect of taxation. That's personal income tax. Two quick questions and closing comments from all three of you. Uh, there is a demand for a reduction of the tax slab rate. There's also a demand that perhaps uh, the maximum trigger of 30 percent. Uh, the income is way higher in other countries, and perhaps India should uh, uh, be on the board uh, and. Uh, sort of combine itself with international best practices. These are two uh, key aspects that uh, popped up in the survey. Uh, your quick uh, closing comments on uh, the personal income tax front. See, I think the most of the survey results say that the rate should be 30 percent. Nobody is talking about the peak rate to be cut. What people are saying is increase the slabs. Is two and a half lakhs enough? Should it be three and a half? Should it be four and a half? Is housing interest deductibility of two lakhs enough? I mean, you don't get anything at 20 lakhs now, right? you should make it 5 lakhs mm -hmm. is atc limit enough to so there are a lot of ask around personal taxes which makes the effective tax lower but i don't think there's an ask to reduce 30 which is which is more competitive there's one more popular ask that should surcharge on the super rich be reduced go away mm -hmm. so on and so mm -hmm. forth so that we will have more disposable income to go out and invest or actually spend more but that may be a good way of triggering demand and hope that disinvestment and other ways of raising money cover it up and then eventually after one year the whole tax collections look better so bankar and rohan we're running out of time a uh, closing comments how populous do you think the budget will be when it comes to personal income tax so bankar quick thought from you well i think uh, there is an increase uh, for atc is clearly on the cards because that's one area where the reserve bank has also expressed concern because of the fall in household savings 
So this is something which I definitely expect, uh, but on the increase in slabs, I think it depends on the fiscal headroom, how much he has. At Rohan, which move would you bet on? Uh, you know, my sense is probably the, uh, the limit will go up and high time that it did because, you know, even if you see inflationary trends, you see a wholesale price index, somewhere what you leave in the hand of your citizen has to reflect the reality of the rest of the, economy. the, rest of the economy. All right. So on that note, uh, we have come to the end of uh, the ET Now KPMG budget poll. Clearly a lot of expectations from Finance Minister Arun Jaitley and let's wait and watch to see whether he meets the expectations of the street, MNCs as well as corporates when he presents his first full year budget on February 28th. Thanks so much for tuning in. Keep it with ET Now for more news and updates.